All right, you guys. So we have a nice little jujube harvest off of really one tree. And this is a potted tree. It's called um, honey jar. I find honey jar produces a lot and it produces early. Definitely the earliest jujube, at least in my yard, consistently. And the fruits are incredible. Now, one of the problems and why I harvested them all today is that they do start to shrivel and they will turn from this lighter green color here that you see, start to turn brown. Here's one that's really green. And then they'll turn brown and then they'll be, you know, pretty much fully ripe when they're, when they're fully brown like this. And then they start to shrivel and turn into a dried fruit, which is, you know, people would describe as a Chinese date. But really, to me, they're nothing like dates. But the problem is once they, once they start to shrivel here, I've noticed over the years they tend to ferment. At least they start to ferment and it's just not pleasant to eat at that point. So when they start to shrivel like this and they start to all turn brown, I typically harvest them. You can even harvest them. I probably should have harvested them a bit earlier, to be honest with you guys. If I had been paying more attention, I would have harvested them earlier, put them in the dehydrator for a little bit, and that would have gotten them dried or somewhat dried, you know, and you can have them stored for a very long time and eat them throughout the winter time. So I personally though like to eat them fresh. So that's, the, that's kind of the problem with this particular fruit here in a humid place, all the fruit flies I have flying around and stuff, it's been not a, it's not really been a great year for the, you know, the fruit quality and the, the fermentation of some of these, these fruit trees. It's just not, it's not good. So let's try, uh, let's try them on camera for you guys. This is a, by the way, the sweetest and really the best jujube I know of um, here. Now, as I said, as it turns brown like this, it doesn't dry yet. It's very crispy. It's a lot like an apple. It's like if you just injected a pretty, you know, not typically a, the most tasty apple, but maybe like your average good apple and you injected it with honey. That's what you get. So not, you know, outrageously complex. I think of these as a good snack. And I bet you if you live somewhere dry where these fruits really should be grown, they're going to be a lot better. Um, probably a little more, bit more complex than what I've mentioned now. When they start to dry, the unfortunate part about this is that I'm afraid to eat any of these. But they will turn into, right now, as they start to dry, and they're not fully dry, they're kind of like a consistency of bread of moist bread. I know that doesn't sound very good. They're not, I think. Once they start to fully dry, then they turn into a dried fruit that really isn't a date by my standards. That's not what, how I think of a date. Um, but you know what? I would consider these a reliable source of food here. Nothing really bothers them. They get pollinated, I think, by the parasitic wasp. So if you got, they call it the big black wasp, try to encourage that wasp to come in. I've even seen uh, ants and flies and things pollinate them and put them in as much sunlight as you can get them in. In these northern places, they need that and they need pollinators and they will continue to flower for a long period. And they will produce in the summer to the fall we are almost in the fall, technically. So this is the end of the summer. I'll go back here and show you guys my potted tree. You can see at the top, there are some fruits that are just not ripe yet. So I'm waiting. I'll get an extended harvest. Now what's in the way of these trees is the pomegranates. They're kind of dropping their leaves because there's not really any fruits on them. 
And what I've done is uh, I've stopped the water a little too much. And that lack of water could have potentially contributed actually to the fermentation that was happening here on this particular tree. The one in the back is doing much better. This is Zhuzhou, no fermentation. The fruits look very good. Again, very, very productive, reliable source of food. But in my opinion, this variety is just not as tasty. It's just not as good. You can see they're a bit more elongated in shape rather than what I've been seeing on the other variety there, which is the honey jar. There's a lot of fruits up here at the top. Honey jar is typically more round, as you can kind of see with this fruit here. So quite a difference in size and in shape. Um, and I'll tell you though, the honey jar just does taste better. I do like the Zuzio and I think I'm highly gonna recommend that. That one was recommended to me by Cliff England at England's Nursery and that's where I got the, uh, I think I got the Scion from him and then I grafted it onto a Lang. Lang requires pollination. It does produce big fruits, but here I've been really struggling with pollination in general. So I have not wanted to mess with that and grow Lang. Maybe in the future, I'll plant a couple of these in the ground on a future property of mine. You also see over here, I have a, a sugar cane and also a Lee in the ground. Behind it is a big Rosianca persimmon. And these guys, I had them in pots and then last fall, I planted them right in the ground and they have just taken off. They've loved it. They're really digging themselves in. They're typically, actually, I like the shape on some of them. This, this um, Lee over here has got some good uh, angles I think to the branches. It's really growing outwards as well as up. Whereas this sugar cane really has a really nice shape to it also. But typically I've seen a lot of them just want to grow straight up and that's it. But this sugar cane is doing fantastic I think in terms of its shape and I haven't done a whole lot of pruning to it other than I guess right after when I planted them. I may have to come in here and cut some of these lower branches back or some of these branches that are kind of creating a mess or encroaching too much on the other trees I have. I mean, I got fig trees all over the place. There's even a little citrus tree down there. And then even back along the fence is a, a grapevine. So there's a lot of food, a lot of fruit trees back in this corner. Um, but I don't, what I don't like with these two varieties, although I think they're good. Lee seems to just alternate bear. And uh, one year it'll produce a ton of fruit and the other year it doesn't. Very strange, I don't know why it happens. It, I would have said the first couple years I had it from a nursery, I would have said it was probably one of the best producers I have in terms of these different varieties. But now I'm, I would just disagree with that. And um, it seems to have this weird bearing habit. The sugar cane, although very sweet, very good fruit, doesn't bear a lot of fruit. So I thought what I should do, instead of growing them in a, in a container, is I should plant them in the ground and uh, get themselves more established, dig themselves in a bit, and hopefully over a couple years, they will pre become productive. And maybe this whole thing of you know, they will flower a lot, by the way. In fact, that's kind of what these, these little fruits up in here were is because they just kept continually flowering. And as, you know, the season kind of they finally progressed, they did set the fruits. But early on, a lot of these fruits, especially down here and a little bit more inwards of the tree, they just didn't set. They didn't, I don't know if they, I'm assuming they got pollinated, but it is what it is. They just don't set the fruits nearly as much. And there are some theories that people in these northern places, colder climates, we just don't get enough sun. 
And that could contribute, of course, that's really a big contributor to a lack of fruit set on just any tree. So that's a, a big one there. That could be the, the reason why this lee and the sugar cane are just not producing as much. Um, but I'm just planting them here in the ground just to see, just to see what would happen over a couple of years to see if the production would improve. Otherwise, I'm gonna in the future just stick with the Zuzio and the, um, the honey jar because they doesn't matter. Every year, every single year, they produce like crazy. Um, and it's, uh, again, a super reliable food source that I think is pretty good. Ideally, what you should do in this place, in this climate, harvest them when they're just turning a bit red, get them all off the tree, throw them in the dehydrator a little bit. They'll start to sweeten up as they dehydrate, right? And then you can even turn them into the full full-blown dates that last for over a year if you dry them. So for me, I think this is a big deal. Growing these fruits is pretty easy here in this climate. The only thing you wanna do is try to encourage some pollinators. I think that's probably the biggest lesson is uh, we don't always have great pollinators where we're at. And things like this sedum really does attract a lot of parasitic wasps and different pollinators that are specific. Even this uh, fennel, this is some bronze fennel here, trying to create the food source for these different pollinators for these jujubes. It's really critical. Not everybody has access to that and, um, or at least has the pollinator numbers that they need, I think. And maybe they do, and maybe it is the sunlight. That's the other, uh, I guess, potential thing. So we'll see you guys soon. Thanks for watching this one. Check out the other videos we've done now on jujubes. We've done them for like years. Thanks for watching. We'll see you guys for the next one. Hit that subscribe button. Take care.